Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to ET Retail. I'm Pallavi, and today we are conducting a virtual panel discussion on the theme boosting customer engagement with an omni channel approach. The once considered easy retail market is not so simple anymore. With, the, with internet penetration, the changing consumer preferences, blurring lines between offline and online, influx of competition and new age brands, uh, retailers have, have, you know, have been forced to up their game and focus on acquiring customers and gaining their loyalty, which is not an easy task anymore. In this evolving retail environment, surprisingly, Omnichannel is emerging as the only constant and the way forward. Companies are actively leveraging omnichannel strategies to bridge the gap between their customers and their services and products. They're, they're relying on omnichannel to build a seamless customer experience and boost engagement. On that note, I'd like to introduce our, panel, our esteemed panelists for this discussion today. First of all, we have Berry Singh, COO, Ace Turtle. Then we have Amrish Sikarwar, who is the business head for Zigbee. Hi, Berry, and hi, Amrish. Very good hi. morning. Good morning. So, uh, Berry, if you like, you would like to give us a brief discussion, uh, introduction of the brand, and also of yourself. Sure. So, let me start with Ace Turtle. Uh, Ace Turtle is a uh, retail tech company uh, which started off uh, ten years back as a SaaS company where we had our only channel product Rubicon, which was uh, being targeted towards you know enterprise customers to give them a single view of inventory and single view of customer. So we started omni-channel when online had just started in India uh, because we could emphasize that's how the consumer is moving. Uh, while on this journey, we became the market leaders in the omni-channel space during COVID is when you know all of us were taken by the surprise. So we also wanted to pivot. Uh, so from just being an enabler, we wanted to be in the driving seat. And that's where we decided that you know rather than just preaching to brands on their omni-channel strategy and helping them scale the business, uh, what if we were to manage these businesses on an end-to-end -end basis and help them scale in a much differentiated way? So we took over the license of Lee and Wrangler and uh, Toys R Us and Davies R Us. And the objective was, can we disrupt and digitally transform these brands using our own technology and product you know, to grow them? So that's been the journey of uh, Ace Turtle. Uh, about myself, uh, I passed out from NIFT uh, way back in 2000. Started with Arvind, uh, where I did multiple roles, and my last role over there was as the business head for Lee. Then I became a part of Reliance Brands, the founding member of Reliance Brands. Uh, the objective of Reliance Brands was to get international brands in India because in 2007 there were hardly international brands in India. So we got close to about 60 odd brands. So I used to head the Timberland, Paul and Shark, Diesel, and Dune and Gas business. So I launched them and built them in India. In 2013, both Nitin and I decided to jump ship. Uh, because we could see how the consumer was evolving and we thought it was the right time to you know do something in this space because uh, retail was either offline and online was just taken up and that's why we thought technology could bridge the gap between online and offline and that's how the journey of face total began wonderful i think very have set the tone for our discussion i like to ask amrish if you can give us a quick brief about zigli and your journey sure so Zigli is a omni-channel platform uh, with presence of uh, retail stores and app uh, plus website. Uh, it's a one and a half year old brand in pet care services and products. So it's a complete ecosystem related to pet caring. And uh, the key problem that we are solving for current pet parents are like, because they uh, in they have to actually struggle for the services related to pets. Uh, I mean, they have to actually search for the veterinarian. They have to search for groomers or maybe for even trainers and the pet products in a very uh, fragmented market. So it's one of the first organized platform where you can get everything at one single place. And that too, with the help of technology, we are providing our customers a complete omni-channel experience uh, and wherein a pet parent can actually book the service at home or even book the service at our experience center and definitely can purchase the products. Uh, so if we look at the current trend, the pets are the new kids and that is exactly where uh, uh, we thought of, okay, uh, because they keep on struggling in terms of getting 
at multiple places and uh, getting into multiple fragmented unorganized uh, service providers uh, they they are not trained enough also even and uh, so we have brought it everything together and on the one single roof and that's how we are helping the pet parents to ensure that their pets get the right uh, treatment right grooming and uh, we pamper them uh, about myself uh, i have uh, 22 years of plus of experience uh, in multiple uh, segments. I started my career after uh, educating from IIT Dhanbad uh, with Colgate Palmolive. Worked with them for seven years in multiple roles in sales and marketing. Uh, then moved to Reliance Communication for two and a half years. Handled their uh, branch for uh, Udaipur. After that, actually, I joined Mars. Mars is a, a renowned pet care leader. Uh, in um, They are known for their brands like Pedigree and Royal Cannon. Uh, that was in 2010. Uh, so for 10 years, uh, I have been with Mars before this incident. And uh, in Mars, uh, worked in multiple roles, multiple geographies, uh, handled the almost like half of Indian market uh, for sales, uh, then moved into e-commerce channel, established their e-commerce channel from scratch, uh, then moved into logistics. And uh, finally, I joined hands with Cosmo first and uh, to start Zigli from scratch, the entire concept of Zigli, the entire building up from scratch. And actually I started, uh, I mean, with the support of the promoters. That's the whole journey about myself and Zigli. Wonderful. Thank you for that introduction, Amrish. And uh, I'll just say that the influx of D2C brands in the pet care market has uh, paved way, you know, for the growth of the industry. Yeah. Um, we also have Rahul Agarwal, he is the founder and CEO of Organic Harvest. Hi Rahul, very good morning. Thank you for joining us. If you can give us a quick introduction about yourself and the brand. Sure, good morning to you and good morning to everyone. Uh, so uh, I represent Organic Harvest and uh, Organic Harvest is an organic uh, range of personal care products. Uh, we are into organic uh, skin care, hair care and body care products. Um, uh, started this journey around 10 years ago. Uh, when we started Organic Harvest, uh, there was no organic range of personal care products. And that's where we saw that there was a clear gap because in 2013 or actually before that, people or consumers started eating organic food. They started using organic cotton as well, but nothing on the lines of organic shampoo, organic cream, organic uh, face wash. So that's where we uh, saw the gap and uh, launched uh, Organic Harvest. We started with a traditional distribution network. Distribute and retail channel partners. So we have B2C. Uh, eventually, it has uh, evolved into D2C as well. Uh, uh, so yeah, last 10 years journey has been very exciting. We are now available across more than 100,000 uh, retail points. Uh, are tr now a truly we are a truly omni-channel present brand. Uh, almost 50% of our sale is from online, or 50% is from offline. And uh, uh, other than India, we are available across 15 odd countries. Uh, about me, I'm a chartered accountant by education. Started my career with Ernst & Young, spent around five years there and then entrepreneurial bug bit in 2007. My first venture was into online education space wherein we were uh, giving online education to students in the US. Uh, did that venture for around seven odd years and simultaneously started Organic Harvest in 2013. So, yeah, that's uh, in nutshell about me and the, the venture that I'm into. Wonderful. Thank you, Rahul. So, I believe we have a very varied uh, set of cohort here. And uh, I think this is going to be a very interesting discussion. I'd like to start with very, um, very the categories that the brand currently plays into and the brands you've been working with or building your own brands. These are all offline heavy categories. But you being a retail tech platform are building their omni-channel strategies. If you can help us understand the basics first, how and when does a, does an omnichannel strategy shape up and what are some key things any brand which is trying to foray into omnichannel, they should keep in mind. Oh, thanks for the uh, relevant question for today's discussion. So we've always seen that, you know, the customers have always evolved much faster than businesses. And that's how, you know, there is a need gap that gets identified. So 
if you go back about 15, 20 years back when the business was primarily offline also, at that point of time, it used to be a multi-channel shopping. So a brand was being distributed across different categories, say either in an exclusive brand outlet or it was present in a multi-brand outlet or say for brands which are into apparel and fashion and some personal care categories, they were also present in department stores. So these customers used to venture into these three kinds of distribution. Now, was it the same customer who was shopping across these three channels? Was it a different customer uh, is a question mark. And the reason why I say it's a question mark because there was no technology which could link the customer journey, which could map the customer journey, whether the same customer at different point of time or a different need would go to an exclusive outlet because he wanted the experience. But when he wanted, say, a pricing advantage, he would go to a multi-brand environment, or if he wanted a choice and a pricing, he would go to a department store. So the consumer has always been multi-channel or omni-channel from that perspective. But when online started to come into play, uh, a lot of people started looking at data and saying that, you know, how can we use data to our advantage? Are there cohorts? Are, are there opportunities to link offline and online? And that's how, to be honest, even Ace Turtle was born to say that can tech integrate between online and offline. So the basic premise of omni-channel, the two fundamental blocks, according to me, for omni-channel is one is the single view of the inventory. Second is the single view of the customer. Because what happens is most of the organization, as they expand, as they grow, they have multiple points of sales. So the inventory gets segregated. Now this inventory, when it gets segregated, it is siloed and it is limited to only that channel for that particular consumer to come and shop from. Whereas in an omni-channel environment, you are expecting the same inventory to be present because the customer can today come to your retail exclusive store in the morning. He might be shopping in an online environment at the comfort of his house using his mobile phone. But can you give him the entire gamut of the product availability? Or when he goes to your retail store, which is a finite area, and can have only limited product assortment or product width. Can you show him the entire customer range, you know, so that he can select and make a buying decision? Similarly, if you look at the single view of the customer, do brands have today the visibility of their footprint of their consumer? Do they know when does this customer shop in an exclusive store? When does he go to a department store? When does he buy? Can we look at a something, a customer who has left a product uh, you know, is an online cart. When he comes to the retail store, can the store manager have that information that, you know, this customer is looking for a black shirt and he had left in his online cart. And when he comes to the show, can you show him the same product? So I think these are the two fundamental basic principles of any Omni channel. Where it's got lacking and challenges, some of the challenges which brands have faced is, as I said, they always had legacy tech systems because people always thought between, say, something which is urgent and important. They always knew this is important as brand could see customers are evolving, but it was never urgent because if you look at from a brand's perspective, they are trying to build a brand. They are trying to solve their problems of supply chain. They are trying to solve their problems of working capital. So there are a lot of challenges that the brands are facing. So they were looking at partners and that's where we saw the opportunity of partnering with some of these brands and help them scale, help them lead the only channel way. So first was to, you know, take care of their tech part. Second was the mindset part of it, because what happens is that every channel head or sales head runs their own mandate. The department store guy is looking for his sales number. The online guy is looking for his sales number. Now to do their own sales number, they are very, very precarious about, you know, how will my number handle? So there is only one person in the organization, which is the CEO of the company, which cuts across the organization, who's seeing the customer from that lens as saying it doesn't make a difference whether he's shopping in X channel or Y channel, as long as he's consuming my brand, can I give him that? So it was a mindset. So we had to work with the CEOs of the organization. We had to tell them that, you know, the mindset of the organization need to change. You need to properly, you know, have an organization structure, which is not siloed in nature, which is seamless in nature, because that's what your consumer is expecting. Finally, a seamless experience, whether he's shopping from X channel or Y channel. So I think these were some of the fundamental challenges and basic tenets of an omni-channel world.
Okay. Okay. No, wonderful introduction. They are very, and there are some very important threads that you mentioned, and we like to discuss each of them as we move forward. Rahul, I like to get your thoughts on the fact uh, you your brand is heavy in offline, and already you're also you know building online very very actively. Uh, how do you plan to channelize your online and offline customer together? I mean, how do you make sure that your online customer gets the same experience online, offline, and vice versa? So uh, to start with, I think uh, being an omni-channel uh, player is no longer a choice with the brand. It's a must because the same consumer is uh, uh, browsing uh, the uh, marketplace websites uh, on their phone. The same consumer is going to the Kirana store and the same consumer is uh, going to the uh, malls uh, during the weekend. So it's no longer a choice. It's a must. Uh, but the challenge is that uh, all these channels, it's very easy to say uh, that uh, Omni channel is the right strategy to go for. But all these channels have their own uh, challenges. Uh, the general trade is absolutely different than modern trade. And similarly, the D2C is absolutely different from the marketplace. So uh, as an organization, uh, you need to understand the, uh, the, the, the challenges of each channel and then uh, address them accordingly. Otherwise, if you keep keep doing this, all the channels with the same uh, strategy, you will never be able to uh, win all the channels. So for us, what we did was that uh, all the channels are being headed by uh, uh, the person who understand that particular channel. And then as Berry was mentioning that the CEO has to play a very important role that because every channel has to get each uh, the their uh, fair bit of share in terms of uh, marketing spend as well as in terms of their uh, channel specific uh, spend as well so yeah i think that's that's a pretty uh, simple thing if we can be very specific about the channel requirement uh, this this strategy can be uh, adopted okay okay uh, amrisha i like to understand from you being a digital first brand uh, Ziggly is not just selling, you know, pet food or pet care products. You're building an entire journey for a pet parent. Right? Yep. And your target audience is very much the online enabled uh, customers. So for you, for raying into offline, why was it important? And again, how are you bridging the two? So uh, look, the customer as of now, their shopping behavior is non-linear. The same customer might be shopping online, browsing uh, I mean, seeing the products offline and vice versa also might be browsing the products online and then purchasing offline. So all that transition is definitely happening. And actually, they want both the convenience also and the experience also. The newest pet parent also, he's looking for, and they're tax savvy, and they are looking for brands that have a presence, both the online and offline. And we need to be futuristic in that. So that's how uh, the journey started, that uh, the same customer is actually booking online, visiting our experience center, taking the services there, and giving the feedback online. So if you look at, uh, I mean, it's just not about uh, the products as of now. It's a complete experience which the customers are seeking for. Another shift which has happened in last uh, uh, decade is it's not just about the needs, what the customer actually is looking for to be fulfilled. It's actually the psychological and the social need as well. They feel proud about being presented on online, browsing online, doing the research, uh, uh, having all the information about the brand. The customer is far, far smarter than you can actually think of. And at the same time, the same customer is lazy also. He needs everything at the tip. He needs everything at, at, at the convenience also at the same time. Uh, right. And that's the kind of experience uh, we want to provide through our brand. And uh, that's where we thought of, okay, bringing everything together and uh, one single roof can be the solution because the customer again is looking for the convenience. I mean, he doesn't want to visit uh, a veterinarian at a, a different location. He doesn't want to go to a groomer at a different location. And at the same time, he wants everything at the tip of uh, the technology, which is the mobile, which is now uh, easily available to everyone. So that's how this entire journey happened. And that's where uh, we have both the concept, the online and offline, and uh, the customer experience is seamless. 
Okay. Wonderful. Um, very, I'd like to understand from you uh, in terms of technology, omnichannel is not just, you know, linking your online and offline store. There are some micro trends in technology, how brands can offer that, offer that premium experience, manage their inventory, manage their supply chain. Uh, they can uh, maybe, you know, enhance the in-store experience in fact. So what are some key technology trends where you see every brand that has to move ahead in this era of omnichannel will have to invest in them? So if we if we talk about the customer experience, let's talk of you know a couple of them. One is on the say pricing front. One of the big grouse for a lot of customers used to be that when I go to the brand's website or a marketplace environment like a Flipkart or Amazon, uh, I look at the price of the product that was discounted or much lower. Whereas when I would go to the retail environment, the price was much higher. So that is why, you know, the customer would gravitate towards online shopping and saying, but look at, think it from a customer's perspective. What is happening is the customer is thinking that, you know, why should I buy? Probably the retail store is cheating me or the guy who's selling the Kirana guy who's selling, probably he's selling. And that guy also is trying to dissuade the customer. So he's telling him actually it's an old dated product. It's a different product altogether. So they are dissuading these customers and saying, this is not the right product. You should not buy from there. In fact, I remember one of our, you know, one of our discussions I was having with the only channel head of John Lewis. And he mentioned there's a brand in UK called Austin Reed. Uh, they were facing similar challenge because typically initially the store guys would in fact dissuade the customer to go to their own website. And they would say, no, sir, actually the product is quite old. Don't go over there, buy from my retail store. It's the same organization but a different messaging which was going. What they smartly did was, they said that if an Austin Reed store, for example, was located in Slough, any online order which is coming from Slough, they will give incentive to their retail store staff. Now, what the trick did was that any customer which was coming to the store, and we know that you know there is never 100% conversion in retail stores, conversion percentage over anywhere between 10 to 20%, these sales staff started promoting their own web store and saying, sir, you didn't like anything, why don't you visit our web store? You'll find multitude of options over there. Now, suddenly a challenge got created into an opportunity. The brand ambassadors became the retail store staff. So first is on the pricing part of it. So what, for example, our platform Rubicon does is that today, if a pricing needs to be changed, it gets changed across all channels. So as a company, we have taken a decision, <clears throat> like Raul was saying that, you know, there are nuances of every channel. I totally agree with him. We have taken a decision. We'll not go into the wholesale channel at all because we can't control that channel at all. There is no data that flows back from a multi-brand environment. We don't want to claim that channel. We will go only into those areas, only those channels where we can get the uh, entire data, whether it's a consumer behavioral data, order data, system data. We need to get all that data back into our system. So we have decided that. Second, we realized even if, in spite of the fact that we were pushing the pricing change from our platform Rubicon, the store guys or the franchisee would probably not change. So we have introduced something called electronic shelf labels in our store. So if you go to a retail store of say Lee on Brigade Road, you would find electronic shelf labels. So the pricing of a retail store visible to the consumer is also getting pushed by our platform over here sitting at head office. Second is on the product availability. Because as I mentioned sometime back that every store has a finite area. You will not be able to display entire width. So there are two challenges in that. One is there is a loss of sale that happens in retail store. Customer goes, Pallavi goes to say a Lee store. She wants a size S. Size M is available. Size S is not available. Now it is not that the size S is not available in the ecosystem. It is just that physically that product is not available at the time she wanted. Second is Pallavi wanted printed tops with you know black uh, solid color as a base. White tops are available. Black tops are not available or some other style was not available. Now, how do you ensure that you tell the customer that these products are available? So we have systems. So you can go to a store. We have QR codes which are there in the store. Customers themselves can scan the QR code, look at the entire range of product which is available over there. So while you have pricing consistency, you also have product consistency. The third is the communication consistency and policy consistency. You do not, cannot have a policy for online different and offline different. So today, if you see a lot of retail stores continue to pressurize the customer, bring the invoice, and then only you can return the product. Whereas in the online environment, 
when the guy comes to pick up the product from your store, he is not even asking for an invoice because all that data is available for him. So you have made the policies different. So I think what we are trying to do is bring tech around it using our own platform to ensure there is consistency of policies, consistency of pricing, and consistency of product across the platform. Wonderful. Very interesting. Rahul, I'd like to get your thoughts on this, on the concept of price consistency and product consistency across online and offline. What are your thoughts and what, you know, what, what is the vision you have set for organic harvest? How do you see the two channels of your brand uh, developing over the years? So I think, yeah, uh, theoretically, yes, uh, there should be price parity, product parity across the channels. But uh, there are certain cases that we have to do the certain differential pricing and differential. Uh, I would not say the product differential, but the uh, the the uh, the sizing differential, the differentiation as far as the channel is concerned, because every channel has its own cost and own profitability associated with it. So, uh, uh, and uh, I, I think we are in a very early stage. India as a market is a very early stage um, in terms of getting the brands getting into an omni-channel environment. So, uh, there are certain products. If I talk about specifically about organic harvest, we have to keep certain products exclusively for certain channels. That's one. And then some products which are which have differential pricing for um, online uh, channels and differential pricing for offline channel as well. Going forward, uh, we would love to see where the consumers and the brands are getting matured enough, the supply chain getting uh, matured enough to, um, uh, uh, to help us in achieving our vision to have a, a same pricing, same product, everything uh, uh, at parity across the channels. But as of now, the reality is that we have certain... Uh, differential pricing and differential uh, grammage of the products available across the channels. Okay, very interesting. Uh, Amrish, uh, your thoughts on this as the company is, you know, slowly foraying into offline, you're a new entrant in the offline space. Which road do you want to take for the company? So it's the price parity has to be maintained. And uh, in fact, that is exactly our online and offline. Our offers and uh, the product pricing is almost similar. Unless or until we have a different objective for certain products or certain, uh, like say campaigns are drive uh, towards that certain objective. So one thing we have to accept is uh, that offline is having its own limitations in terms of keeping the product, the assortment and all that things. And at the same time, the footprints. While online has a larger canvas to play, the online has a larger canvas in terms of product assortment, the offerings that uh, you can actually provide to the customer and at the same time the reach. So uh, to acquire more and more customers, uh, yes, with certain objectives or certain timelines, you might to need to have a different strategy for online, but at the same time need to ensure that that strategy doesn't become a problem for you, doesn't become a challenge for the offline uh, channel. And the customer should fee not feel cheated or customer should not feel, okay, okay they already have a price differentiator, uh, which is uh, uh, for any particular product or any particular service. Uh, there's a different pricing for online or there are different pricing for all offline. Then it's not an omni-channel experience. So when we are talking about the seamless experience, the seamless experience has to be in terms of their choice also. So when they are browsing, when they are looking for or searching for a particular product at a particular price point, it should be seamless on both the channels. Uh, as I shared, it's about the experience and the convenience. So he should see, okay, if I am not willing to step out of my home and it's a convenience to stay in the home and I need to get the products. So he should feel confident, okay, if even I book any service or even if I book a product, um, it will be provided to me at the same price point, which I will actually visit the store and purchase. Yes, certain products might have a differentiator, uh, but yes, that has to be in such a smart manner that the customer actually agrees or happy to pay for that. So like if the product is heavy, bulky and all that and customer sees, okay, if I am paying uh, rupees 50 more uh, for the convenience, it's okay, I'm willing to pay. I mean, I mean, we everyone is 
uh, seeing the, like what Zwiggy, Zometo, uh, we are ready to pay rupees 25, 30 or whatsoever the subscription is, right? Because there you are paying for the convenience, right? So all that uh, uh, experience has to be there. The strategy has to be in such a manner that price parity is also maintained. And at the same time, customer doesn't feel that there's a too much of differentiator on online and offline uh, as far as the pricing strategy is considered. But at the same time, what customer is looking for, he gets uh, as per his convenience, as per his availability for the channel. And each channel has a different role to play. So the offline has a, its own role to play and online has its own role to play, right? Uh, similarly, the modern trade has its own role to play. I mean, uh, I remember the days uh, some 15 years back when modern trade was actually stepping in into India. And there was a I was, uh, at the time in handling the, uh, the channel sales. So we used to hear a lot of from the, the moment pound shop and all that things, like the modern trade will eat into their business and all that things. Look at what has happened. Actually, nothing changed after that. In fact, the consumption actually increased because the customer was given choice. The customer was given an accessibility to a lot more products by these modern trades. And suddenly, all those nearby grocery moment pop shops, they also upgraded. They upgraded their assortment. So that is how it will happen. And that is how it will happen in this own, uh, online and offline also. They both will exist, but at the same time, they will complement each other. I don't see that they will be competing with each other, in fact. So we have to maintain that pricing strategy accordingly. No, absolutely, Amrish. I think I second your thought. Um, Berry, you mentioned some very interesting points about in-store data, such as electronic shelves and a QR code that you mentioned that will give consumer the add-on, uh, you know, product uh, portfolio. Can you share if you're, uh, you know, witnessing some interesting trends on that front? Do you see your customers actually converting more because of this particular offering? So one, for example, all our stores today are connected with all demand channels. So today, for example, a Lee store or a Wrangler store is not just dependent upon walk-in. It's also getting digital orders. Today, 25% of all our sales of retail stores are coming through digital channels, including the web shop for the brand, which is a Lee.in, or a Flipkart, Mintra, Geo. So we have integrated with all of them. The advantage that we have is we are a tech company first and a, to be honest, a retailer, we became data. So we already had the tech which was pre-integrated to these platforms. So it was very easy for us to integrate with the point of sale system and expose the inventory that is lying in the retail stores. Uh, twofold advantage that we are seeing through that. One, our cost of logistics have gone down because if a customer who's based out of Dhanbad, you know, places an order, he's not getting fulfilled from my mother warehouse in Bangalore. He's being serviced from a store which is there in Dhanbad. So the cost of logistics is much, much lower. Second, the speed of delivery, because today no marketplace has an, uh, you know, fulfillment center in Dhanbad. And the reality for the next 10 years, we don't plan to have, uh, you know, a fulfillment center over there, but a retail store is servicing the need. So the role of retail stores is also changing. And we're bringing, as I said, you know, so one part is the whole QR code where you're changing the customer experience. Second, you are changing the profitability of retail stores. Uh, you know, we spoke about some of the fellow colleagues spoke about, you know, every channel having its own dynamism, its own profitability and stuff. We understand in retail, the costs are all fixed. So, you know, your rental is fixed, your store operating cost is fixed, your staff cost is fixed. So if you don't have more business coming out from the same area, then your profitability very easily can move from green to red. So you need to increase. But what is the biggest constraint in any kind of retail business? The biggest constraint is the traffic because that's only one thing which is not in your hand. I can open a retail store. I can have a very cool staff serving the customer. I can have the right inventory. But if the traffic doesn't go into my store, okay, then I'm doomed. So it is very critical for us to ensure that, you know, one, if the customer is not coming, then an order needs to come to the store. Second, if the customer is coming, how are you ensuring that the conversion is happening? Now to do the conversion also, while you're offering, you know, different technology uh, ideas to the customer to place an order, we are also looking at an offline funnel. So online, we all know, used to have a funnel. So I today have full visibility through my own nature account or my Google Analytics to see how many people came to our website, how much time do they spend, they landed on which homepage, then they went to the PLP page, how many people added a product to the cart, how many bought, how many did not buy, then I retargeted. 
all of that was happening in the online world. But what about the offline customer? So what we have also done is we are creating an offline funnel, which means today I have cameras which are identifying consumer cohorts and saying what kind of consumer. So we don't go into personal information, but we are creating cohorts of consumer. What kind of customers are coming into the retail stores? How many people who came into the store bought, took a product to the trial room? We have smart mirrors that have got installed in the trial rooms where customers can see the product that they bought. Now, if they want, don't like the product, it is also showing at that point of time for that, you know, what are the other recommendations? So we are seeing that at an area where we can help them through personalization, through recommendations and suggestions over there. If a particular size is not fitting the customer, imagine the plight of the customer for jeans that he has to go back outside, tell the sales staff, no, I don't need a 28, now I need a 30. Imagine in the trial room itself, if you can say, I don't need 20 and I need 30. The information goes back to the store manager. The sales staff puts a rack outside. There is a 30 already available. That is you are making the life of the customer so much easier. The other challenge, for example, we found out 82% of all denims get altered in our store. But everything is on a alteration bill book that is maintained. There was no data. Now, if that data comes into my system and I know that I can change the inseam length of a jeans, from 34 inches to 31 inches, I am saving three inches every time. Why am I even producing 34 inches? That can save my fabric cost and consumption. It will add to my bottom line. So I think technology, if used properly, it can give advantages to the business and to the consumer both. Okay, very interesting. Um, Rish, I'd like to uh, understand from you, you know, pet, um, the needs of pet parents are very customized. I mean, they're very super personalized from what I understand. You know, what kind of data, what kind of insights are you getting and how are you, you know, using that back in your system? Okay, so uh, the, the personalized experience, again, uh, it's, it's actually, again, not something which is considered as a delight. It is a need. Uh, as far as we are considered, it actually makes more relevance in pet caring because for a pet, their need actually changes with their with the breed, uh, even with the life stage they are into. Uh, so a puppy need is different absolutely than an adult need. A Labrador breed uh, needs are different than a German Shepherd need. And similarly, the Sudzi needs are different than any other breed. So what happens, uh, the kind of service, the kind of product and uh, the kind of uh, caring Again, it changes from customer to customer requirement. So uh, whenever we are onboarding any uh, pet parent, we ensure that the entire data related to the pet is actually captured. And that's how we use data in terms of providing the personalized pet care experience to the pets. And uh, we do a lot of uh, data mining at the back end. Uh, we used actually uh, tools like data pool and CRM, uh, wherein we ensure that the customer gets the right kind of content, right kind of awareness, even the right kind of guidance for the products. Uh, because uh, 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 pets need changes with the life stage also, and actually that changes more frequently than even the, the human need. And in fact, our investment majorly is going into technology wherein we can leverage data, uh, wherein we can actually ensure that the customer uh, gets the right kind of information, right kind of product counseling, uh, because we believe that it's not about the sales now, it's about the counseling. The customer wants to have a choice, but at the same time, he doesn't uh, want that any push sale has to happen. He wants that the control has to be with him. But at the same time, he is looking for certain guidance. He is looking for certain counseling who can actually help him for the right choice. So we leverage data to help the customer for that right choice. And that's how we provide the personalized experience to them. Okay. Uh, Rahul, a similar question to you. Uh, in, in the skincare, in the beauty market, we saw the rise of uh, clinically recommended products, you know, uh, beauty brands, onboarding, doctors and uh, yeah, experts to help customers get the right product for their skin, customized product for their skin. What are your thoughts on that? And again, at Organic Harvest, how are you using data to help the customer get what will actually suit their skin?
um, Rahul, you are on mute. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. No. So rightly said, uh, uh, this industry has been using this strategy to customize the product since long. Uh, but what um, at Organic Harvest we did different was we uh, introduced technology to it. Uh, so there was no human intervention. We developed an app which can assess or which can analyze your face and based on that analysis can uh, suggest the product which uh, you should be using. So that's the only the starting step. And once you use that app, uh, your uh, profile as unique profile is created. Every time, once you start using organic harvest products, and then maybe after two or three months, you analyze your face again, the app will give you the exact differences which your skin has uh, experienced over last uh, uh, three months. That's uh, that's the second use of the app. And third is the the lot of uh, the data that we get on the back end. Once somebody analyzes their skin, we get to know what kind of consumer needs are evolving because. Uh, you see, the consumer's needs are ever evolving. We uh, uh, used to have only one face wash around 15 years ago. Now we have a single consumer might be having three face washes because their uh, needs uh, are no longer limited to only one concern. So uh, we also get to see uh, the kind of concerns which the consumers are asking for. And then based on that data, our R&D &D team can uh, uh, do the... Uh, the new product introduction around it. So that's a classical case of introducing the uh, technology with and matching it with the consumer's need. Wonderful. I think I'm very motivated to try out, you know, the organic harvest app. Please do. Please do. So uh, I think we've covered all my questions and very interesting, uh, you know, insights there. All of you. Before we close and wrap up the discussion, I'd like to go around and get your closing comments on the one trend in omni channel which you believe will be you know the next big thing where every omni channel brand will be focusing on which will be investing on we can start with Betty. so i think more than the trend one of the most important things for omni channel is the whole mindset issue i think technology is an enabler uh, technology can be made available to any organization uh, small to large you can make it a priority but if the mindset of the organization is not there uh, because it took also involves some tough decisions that need to be taken. Like we took a tough decision. We'll not be in the wholesale environment. We know it's a, to be honest, it's a multi-million dollar opportunity if Lee and Wrangler has to be sold across 5,000 mom and pop stores. So before we took over, you know, they were available. But it's a conscious decision because we want to be true to the word only channel, uh, true to the technology that we have created and give that customer the experience. In terms of a trend, I think chat GPT is what something, you know, all of us have been talking about. We think uh, that's going to be big. A lot of use cases we have already, for example, our entire catalog information is now being called out through chat GPT. Uh, we are looking at more customer support. We are looking at recommendations. So anybody which is in the fashion, beauty, lifestyle industry, we all look at, you know, some kind of advice. Earlier advice were given, being given by, you know, technology tools. We are looking at bots. But now this is even being filtered through, you know, somebody giving you a personalized advice depending upon the input that you are feeding. So I see chat GPT playing a big, big role across, you know, multiple areas. Wonderful. Amrish, your thoughts? Uh, so, uh, my thoughts are pretty similar to Barry's thought, in fact. Uh, so, if you look at the change which has happened now is everything is actually into the hands of customer. The control is in the hands of customer. I mean, if I look at some 20 years back, the control used to be in the hands of channel or the manufacturer. You, put, you actually have a product, uh, manufacturer used to create a brand and the customer was left with no other choice but to get pursued with that brand and then select it. But now the, the roles are reversed. Now the control, everything is in the hands of a customer. So the organization mindset has to actually very similar to that, uh, that whatever they are doing, if it is impacting the customer, then they are going in the right direction. If it is not impacting the customer, then actually they are not getting into the right direction. Be it finance, be it your uh, backend team, like even HR, uh, even the training. If they are able to provide the training in such a manner that it is impacting on a positive side to the customer, then they are doing their job. Or else there is a gap. The another change which I feel and which I foresee is the impact of technology. 
and artificial intelligence and AR VR is going to be the next big change uh, that is going to play a make major shift in uh, where uh, the virtual and augmented reality can create uh, immersive and personalized experience than even with the current uh, far better than even the current scenarios uh, and actually the customer will be able to use the product or visualize the product in their own environment and interact their own way use them uh, feel the experience in a virtual or maybe in an augmented reality and then return it back or decide uh, whether they want to purchase the product or they don't want to go ahead with it uh, the things like Internet of Things uh, will play a major role in terms of customer behavior and experience also as well. So all these will be going to be the next big shifts that are going to happen. Very well said. Uh, Rahul, if you can share your thoughts. Sure. So I think um, uh, uh, online and offline uh, both have its own advantages. Online convenience, offline experience. What I would love to see that uh, these two things can be swapped. So if online can give us the experience and offline can give us the convenience, uh, uh, the experience or the convenience maybe through AI, VR, AR, I have don't, I don't have the answer as of now, but that would be the ideal world to live in. Mm -hmm. If we can have best of both the worlds across the channels and uh, to top off it, uh, if we can have the same pricing and same product available across the channels. So that, that would be the ideal world. Uh, I think none of us would be able to see the light of that day, uh, but I'm hopeful if we can do that, uh, we'll be more than delighted. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, gentlemen. It was a wonderful uh, discussion, some very interesting points shared. And uh, I really hope that we all catch up again and have another set of insightful discussion. This time, maybe on how we already have, you know, uh, implemented price parity across channels. <laughs> Thank you again.